begin with our House candidates, uh, Roger Scrava, Rob Eklund, Spencer Igo, Julie Sandstead, Matt Noring, and Dave Lislegar. And since we had four people before, and they didn't really follow the time rule, uh, you know, I'll, I'll keep you guys on a tight leash. Let's keep our answers short. It, it's okay to say, I agree with so-and-so, let's move on to the next question. Um, but I do want to cover a lot of content here. So as we get started, um, you know, either make an opening statement, introduce yourself, or, and or, answer this question, Iron Range towns have been losing population, and schools have seen declining enrollment. What do you see your role in ensuring that students in the Iron Range have the best public education system? Roger, we'll start with you and we'll go down the line. Uh, thank you. Uh, Take the mic, up, please. <clears throat> yep. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rams. I'm a member of Rams. I'm the mayor of Ely. Uh, to answer the question, uh, I've, I've been involved in politics a long time, and I'm going to jump into the question right away. Uh, repeat it again, though, please. Iron Ranch Towns have been losing population uh, yes. and declining enrollment. How do you ensure that we have the very best public school system? Well, you know, uh, the Democrats keep throwing millions and millions and millions of dollars at it, and it keeps getting... I'm not sure what it is right now. I'm really disappointed in our school system where we are uh, now that we found out that the Minnesota Department of uh, Education has also uh, lost a few, a few dollars here and there and no one knows where it went. I'm more concerned about Northern Minnesota. How are we gonna grow our population? Uh, I've been door knocking and talking to communities, Beaver Bay, Silver Bay, International Falls, um, I've been everywhere and talking to different communities. The issue is population loss. Um, <clears throat> the fewer people we have in northern Minnesota, the fewer students. The harder it is to operate a school. Uh, just talking to the mayor of Tower who lost their school, they're kind of like, yeah, we know the feeling, we know what's going on. Uh, Ely, we just, uh, we we're investing about $27 million in a new school and our population went to 3,200. I'm concerned we have to get more jobs up here or we have to figure out um, how to set the job. The metro area keeps growing, why? Are there incentives in the metro area that we don't have? Are there incentives that we can use to get jobs up here? Uh, Woodbury's overgrown, maybe we can get some of those people in Woodbury to come up to the Iron Range, to Ely, and find a way uh, to, to make the businesses, uh, uh, make it more affordable for them to come here. Uh, I see our school system, um, in, in my opinion, I see our school system is failing right now, and I'm not sure the proper way to fix it. I have not been in the legislature to watch it, but I, I really want to look, I want to work to make it better, because when I went to high school, Tom. we had a great, we had a great opportunity, and I hope to make it good again. Thank you. Rob Eckler. Well, thank you, and thank you, Rams, for setting this up. I'm Rob Eklund from International Falls, and uh, you know, that's a terrific question. Uh, one of the things that I've been the champion of since I've been at the legislature is broadband funding. And you're seeing broadband projects go in all across rural Minnesota. Broadband is the economic driver for our new economy. That's how we're going to start getting new people here, by attracting folks that can work here. We proved during the pandemic that some folks can work from home and can be very productive. And so that's one of the things that we need to do. We also need to support our mining projects, especially our taconite plants that are, that are uh, working now. And we need to do what we can to make sure whether we can or can't do copper nickel um, uh, safely and, and easily. Those are the things we need to do to bring more people to the, to the area and help our schools prosper. The only way you can get our schools to prosper is to have a better tax base, and these are the type of things that we can do as a community and as an Iron Range working collectively to make sure they happen. Spencer. Thank you, well yes, I'm Spencer Igo. I'm the current state representative for Itasca and Cass counties. So this is a multifaceted question. Um, you know, I think we need to start with, there's kind of a, a way I look at policy and how we work on it in the state of Minnesota. And is the policy going to give Minnesotans a hand up, or is it going to give Minnesotans a handout? So when it comes to education, how we can help our local schools, we need to be talking to our local educators. We need to be talking to our superintendents. We need to be talking to our school boards. Because no one knows better what our students and our kids need than those people. 
So there's tons of policy we can do to do that to make sure our school districts can apply that to their districts. Now, when it comes to some types of education inside our school districts, we need to be doing more to support a kind of an all of the above approach for students to be able to pursue whatever they wish. Whether that's going into STEM, whether they want to go to a four-year education, or maybe that's opening up avenues for them to be able to work with the trades and apprenticeships so they can get real-world skills so when they graduate high school, they're entering our workforce. That's where we start retaining our youth, that's where we start growing our communities. I think we also couple that, you know, Rob and Roger made a lot of really good points there about retaining you. I agree with all those, all those statements. But one observation that I have is that many of my friends who have left the region um, and are now getting married and having their first children are realizing the call to return home. And we as a community all across the range need to come together in this era of partnerships to work together to open up our homes and our regions to bring these people back. And we're going to bring about the world of tomorrow where you are going to bring our best days to reality. Thank you. Julie. I'm Julie Sandstead. I am the state representative out of the current 6A, uh, which will somehow become 7A here eventually. I am a hometown girl. Welcome to my alma mater. You are sitting in the castle in the wilderness. This was our beautiful high school built in the 1920s, built by mining dollars. How do we keep our students here? How do we strengthen our education? We have to have jobs. We have to be protecting the jobs that we currently have, and we have to be diversifying the economy to be drawing in additional jobs. Without employees, without the jobs up here, we don't have students. But once we have those students, we need to make sure they have the best education possible. I am very, very proud of public education and the work that our educators and our paraprofessionals and our school districts are doing. This is no easy task. And how do we make sure that they have what they need, our students have what they need in the classroom? We give our teachers the supports they need. It is no longer just a teacher that is needed in a classroom. We need our ESPs. Our school districts need school nurses. We need counselors. We need school social workers. Our communities up here that are struggling need addiction treatment centers. We need mental health supports in order to make our students succeed. We need to respect our profession of educators. We cannot continue to be talking about failed education and failed teachers constantly. It's disrespectful to the profession. And if, unless you've been in a classroom and worked with students, you have no idea the needs that teachers are dealing with every day. We are not just educators. We have to be the parent, the, the counselor, the nurse, the um, spiritual advisor for some of them. Our list is not just about sitting down and doing our job anymore. Our kids are coming into the classroom sometimes without a home, sometimes without a meal. We need to make sure that in order for our schools to survive, our students have what they need that's in and outside of the classroom. Thank you everybody for being here. My name is Matt Norrie. I'm running for House District 7B. Uh, I definitely agree with everybody up here. Our schools are uh, very important. Uh, I think that uh, coming from a small business background, uh, uh, business is so important to a community because it brings in more people and obviously more dollars. So I think if we have a better tax structure for our uh, small business especially and our uh, large industry, that will retain and uh, attract more people. Um, our uh, which will bring more kids into our schools. Uh, I'm very fortunate enough to uh, live in Virginia, Minnesota, where my kids do attend public school. I think it's an absolutely great uh, place to grow up and, um, and, and go to school. Uh, my wife was a paraprofessional for a while, so I do understand the needs for, um, for all sorts of different uh, factors in, in the school, but um, what I really want to do is keep more local teachers here, and I feel like if we can, um, uh, it just keep more jobs here, uh, keep more families here that will that will raise more uh, people that would love to go into the profession of teaching and that will uh, foster more uh, community involvement because now you know who your teacher is of your of your child and I think that is by far the most important thing to have community and, um, and education together. So thank you very much. Dave Lislico. Well, I would like to uh, thank all of you guys for uh, coming out in Masabi Daily News in Rams for 
for hosting this um, and for our moderator coming up. Uh, you do an outstanding job in reporting across the state of Minnesota. Thanks. So, and thanks to all the uh, panelists up here. I think that we're, we all have a, a heart for the region and uh, to represent the people. So I think the question was uh, declining population. And I think that there's a couple different reasons. Um, if you go back in the 1950s, the family structure, um, you know, had five kids. Uh, and then over time, it goes from five to, you know, four to three to two to one. And so we have less. And then as the mining industry went and, and transitioned um, to bigger equipment, more modernization, the workforce is less. And that's just a reality. When we talk about education and we talk about the foundation, that is what we need to build, is a solid foundation. Investing in education, investing in our schools, investing in the best, and that is what the Iron Range has done over the years, and I think it's important that we can continue to do it. You know, it's, 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 it's bricks and mortar, but it's also the investment in our children and in our teachers. And as we see, um, you know, people with mental health and all the different challenges, my heart goes out to the teachers. It's one of the most difficult professions to do. You think about it. Seven hours a day, those teachers are with your children. They care for them. They teach, her, they teach them. They mentor them. They deal with all of the issues that they have. So we do need to invest, and I think that that's part of it, but it's building a foundation. You know, as a former city councilor and as a former mayor, and uh, in fighting for these education and edu uh, the investment in our schools, you look at uh, the Masabi East, what a wonderful facility with that investment. You look at Rock Ridge, what a wonderful investment. Ely's in the process of making an investment. Mountain Iron, all of the different schools and the county schools making that investment, that is setting the foundation for our children. But it comes down to jobs. We need to unleash, we need to protect what we have, and we need to expand. We need to expand in copper nickel mining. We need to diversify our economy. Rob talked about broadband. They talk about equity and equality across the state of Minnesota. We don't have that up here. And in some sense, we're being left behind. And those kind of investments are going to help build the foundation for the future. Thank you. Dave, we're going to start the next question with you. What should be the focus of the IRRRB? And are there any changes in the structure that you would support? Well, I think that we need to uh, focus. IRRRB serves multiple purposes. And I think that the IRRRB needs to focus on economic development. Um, but also supporting the communities. And I want to talk a little bit, um, there's a misconception uh, across the Iron Range of, of where the money comes from. A lot of people think that we're sending the money south. That's not true. The mining companies, um, they pay a production tax in lieu of property tax. And every single one of them dollars stay here. And they go to the IRRRB and they invest in multiple things. In small communities, it's important to understand this, in small communities, they don't have the capital, they don't have the tax base, they don't have the wealth to do all the local projects themselves. That's where the IRRRB and bonding is essential to make it successful. The IRRRB is extremely important. That is our dollars. That is the Iron Range's dollars, and I promise you that no dollars, production tax dollars, in lieu of property tax from the mining companies, leaves. When people say that it's leaving, leaving here, they got to keep in mind where that stuff's coming from. Those are royalties. That's the misconception. Those are royalties, either owned by the state of Minnesota or they're private. And then those dollars circulate all around. The IRRRB is an extremely important agency that needs to focus on broadband, it needs to focus on infrastructure, and it needs to focus on job creation for to diversify our economy while supporting our number one, and that is the mining industry, and supporting our schools. Matt Norton. Well, 
I also agree that the IEEE is very, very important to our region, especially because all the money does come from our great industry. Uh, I got to witness firsthand the, uh, what great things the IEEE can do for small business. Uh, being in the uh, beverage uh, wholesale business, there was a lot of startups uh, that came with IEEE dollars. Uh, for me, I believe that we need to protect the fund at all costs. Um, I know that it was uh, pillaged at one point. Uh, as a legislator, I would uh, make sure that that was protected uh, for, it would never go anywhere but this region. And uh, I mean, that's, that's kind of all I got there, so. Julie. I definitely think the IRRRB is, <clears throat> excuse me, purpose and function is economic development. Um, but that takes on many different facets, and I know the other representatives mentioned it, we'll talk more about that, but one of them is the broadband issue, which is a huge economic driver in our region, and it's going to continue to be so as we talk about growing the economy and growing the population, broadband is critical. You cannot, you cannot attract um, business or families if you, if you didn't have sewer or water or electric hookups, people wouldn't come. Today, we're living in an age that if you don't have broadband, they're not going to come. So we need that. So the, the role of the IRRRB is economic development, but they are also partnering with local governments. We saw this firsthand just recently over at the Canisteo pit. We have a huge public safety issue that is pending. Um, and it, had it not been for the IRRRB and their funding, we were really scrambling to get things done. So the agency is working with the state government, the agency is working with local government, it's working with uh, large business, small business, but again, it's advancing the Iron Range. That is really the role. It is advancing business and population and initiatives that are of the Iron Range, born on the Iron Range, and within the Taconite assistance area. Spencer? So to kind of take the conversation in a different route, you know, I think the most important thing to remember about the IRRR is how unique it is. Um, it is about the only state agency in the entire country that sees revenues come from the region that they're in and stay there. It is literally the only, I mean, when you, you talk to legislators from around the country, they are baffled by this. And that just shows how special it is. To show how great it is, you know, so many projects, and we just heard about how many ways it's lifted up communities. Um, one of those ways is something that I worked on in the, in the past two years in the legislature with Senator Bach. Uh, that was the Huber Project in Cohasset. Um, a $550 million investment uh, on the western part of the range, 150 jobs and a Fortune 20 company. Why were they able to look at locating here and coming to the, coming to the range in northeastern Minnesota? Because of the IRRR. Not only because of the, the funds and dollars that exist there to help with uh, startup and bringing companies here, but with the, the amount of expertise and knowledge that they have there to dive into our region and give the data needed to market us. And I think, you know, the question was, how can we add changes to the actual plan? And I think that's the one thing, you know, everything we're all going to talk about here, most of us agree on. But I think one avenue we really need to go down is how we can advertise our region for how special it really is. I mean, I, I'm running for this office because this is my home. And the man I am today is because of the blessing I had being raised here. So if we at the IRRRB can use the dollars that come from our region, to grow it by advertising how amazing it is with the things that we're doing with the funds there. Imagine the world we can have, imagine the range we can have in the years to come, and that's what I think we should do. Thank you. So a few years back, I think five or six, uh, we had an audit of the IRRR, and there was, uh, that was the change. Now it's the IRRR, one of them used to be IRRRB. I still call it the IRRRB, just because I, just because I do. <laughs> but the audit took care of a lot of issues that we had with the IRRRB, and so I, I don't think, because of that, because the changes are made, I don't think that, I, at that time, I don't think there does need to be a lot of changes. I think we can be proud of what the IRRRB has done through working through economic development, uh, Huber projects, uh, Representative Igo brought up, took a lot of work by staff to bring, bring that to hopefully fruition. Um, but the other thing we need to talk about is economic diversity, because this is you know, where the, we stand on we stand on the three things: timber, taconite, tourism. But in order to grow the economy, grow the region, we need to diversify as well. We need to support all of those, but we need to start working on building up the cottage industries, building up the things that we can do through broadband, 
that uh, Representative Sandstead, Representative Wisgard just brought up. I truly believe that uh, broadband is going to be what's going to be the difference in northern Minnesota's economy in the years to come. And I think we're uniquely uh, situated to do that. Last last uh, session, we passed a broadband bill that raises the cap and raises and lowers the match. That's going to be terrific for northern Minnesota to be able to do that because we have big townships that don't have a lot of people in them. They have a lot of area, and they can't afford to come up with the dollars that they need to uh, get broadband. I'm looking at one of my friends now that's not, and she knows what I'm exactly what I'm talking about. So these are the kind of things that I think the IRRB can get more actively involved in to make our economy more diversified and ready to move into the 21st century. Roger. Thank you. It would be easy just to say I agree with everyone and move on. But I do, want, I do want to say a couple of things because <clears throat> I do agree everyone. Um, and I'm marking the key words here like broadband has been said five times now by all of us at some point. So it's, it is obviously a very big thing. The city of Ely put in our own broadband. IRRB helped us. We used our uh, PPP money plus um, the IRRB. I can, I can list the things that we have used, the city of Ely has used the IRRB as a match for. The key to, to the IRRB funding for any infrastructure or anything, the downtown revitalization, the business development, uh, the schools, the, the school tax, we as a community have to put some skin in the game, some money in the game. And, and it's important. Some of the communities uh, think they should just get money from the IRRB and that should be the way it is. But when you put a little bit in, like Ely will put in 400,000, go to the IRRB and get 150. Then we go to CDBG and get 100. And then we go to EDA and get you know uh, half a million or a million. And that's how you build the projects. And that IRRB is the place where it starts. So, and the staff, I want to thank the staff and uh, Mark Phillips for the fantastic job they do. As a legislator, I will protect and um, make sure the IRRB stays the way it is. I have absolutely nothing against it. I think it's a, it's a wonderful organization, and it is so unique that when um, um, uh, Commissioner Surditch was IRRB commissioner, he had a whole uh, program that he took around the state, and we showed it at a League of Minnesota Cities to a bunch of uh, windmill people in southern Minnesota and said, this is what you guys need to do. You need to organize yourselves like us and go to the legislature and tell them that you want tax money from the windmills so that you guys can reinvest in yourselves. And, and it is so unique, Spencer, you are correct, it, and we need to emulate it in other places in the state, and I just think it's uh, something we should protect and we should be proud of. That was one little thing, there, Andrew. Just kidding. Just <laughs> Uh, I'm going to start this next question with uh, Representative Sandstead. Um, there remains conversation conflict around non-ferrous mining. How do we break the logjam and what lessons can be learned from the last couple of years about the debate? Well, let's just start with a little question there. <laughs> okay. Um, first of all, we have to talk facts. There is so much misinformation being put out. Um, and much of what you hear around non-ferrous mining is from groups that actually exist only to stop a process. I think we would be well served to have something like Canada does uh, with a mining ministry. These are really large, lofty goals, but I think Minnesota would do well to have something like that. Um, we need to just come to terms with the fact that we are living in a century right now that is requiring non-ferrous materials. We need the critical minerals that Minnesota is blessed with, that we are blessed with here on the Iron Range and in the Duluth Complex, in the Talon Complex, in abundance. We need to do this safely. I have every confidence as a person who has grown up on the range that we can do this safely. We need to, we, we live in a mining community. We have a beautiful environment. We have some of the cleanest waters, period. And that doesn't have to change. I do think that we need to just not, I think people in general are afraid of change. Change itself can be a very scary thing. And when you're talking about mining that we haven't had on the Iron Range, that's change. We've seen it done poorly in other countries. And we know that that isn't a Minnesota way. That's not the way it's going to happen when it happens here on the range. We can't have shortcuts. We can't cut corners. We need to do it properly. 
But we need to have a very transparent process. We need to make it clear what our goals are. As an educator, we have SMART goals. We state our objective. They're time bound. We know exactly what we need to do. It shouldn't be that complex when it comes to permitting and the mining industry. We can do this better. Um, we just need to have timelines. The other thing that we really need to do is we need to staff our offices. When we're talking, whether it's the DNR or different agencies, we have so many positions right now that are unfilled and the permitting process is taking far too long because we don't have the staff. We need to get those people in the position. We need to get the right people in the position and we need to pay them a salary that is competitive so they are not going out into private industry. We don't need to be afraid of change. And I know, I know we can do non-ferrous mining here in northeastern Minnesota, in northern Minnesota, safely. Spencer? So, I'm a very proud and loud supporter of non-ferrous mining. Um, in fact, that was one of the first bills that rolled when I entered the legislature was to make Minnesota a mining-friendly state. Um, the main part of this question is how do we stop, stop the logjam? Um, since leaving the, le the legislature adjourned, I've actually been spending the summer talking to legislatures from around the state, um, having long conversations, educating them, and building relationships. Because the thing is, is that right now it may be copper nickel mining, right? Right now it's polymet and talon uh, and tech. But moving forward, it's affecting everything. And it was man it mentioned before me here, you know, the DNR, the MPCA, we need to make sure that they're fully staffed. Not only that, but they need to be accountable to the taxpayers. They are the state agencies that are supposed to work for us. And when we have mining companies that are coming to our Northland, coming to the range, uh, and want to do value-added mining in our communities, to make our communities strong and build them, we can't have their requests for permits getting put in the bottom desk drawer and being stuck there for 17 years. That's unacceptable. We need to start investing in policy that's going to hold our state agencies accountable so we in our communities that here that are waiting on these projects can start supporting them and seeing their fruition. With that, we also need to make sure we are allowed advocates in St. Paul. When I was in St. Paul, I took the House floor over a dozen times to fight for mining. I cannot say the same for the, my colleagues on the stage today. I stood there and fought for mining and asked for their votes and amendments to try and get some pro mining legislation passed in the Minnesota House. It was shot down time and time and again. We need to stand united on this front and not let party differences decide whether or not we get things done. And that is my commitment to you. Thank you. Rob? It would be nice if the uh, amendments were germane to the bill we were talking about, but we'll discuss that at a later point. Um, the logjam that's going on right now is exactly what Representative Igo just brought up, the differences between being a Republican and being a Democrat. Washington politics has come to Minnesota. It's ugly. It's not nice. And until we figure out how to, how to get past that, we're going to have a hard time getting anything done. But about back to the copper nickel uh, non-ferrous mining. Our agencies are accountable. They are understaffed. They are not here to promote the mining industry. They are here to help the mining industry through their permitting process through the hurdles that need to be done. They're supposed to be non-biased. They are not, like I said, they are not promoters. If we're gonna promote anything in the state of Minnesota, then we need to develop legislation that does just that. Uh, some of us attempted to do that a while back with the uh, Office, Office of Outdoor Re Recreation. It hasn't got funded yet, but it's an idea. So, getting past the logjam is to try to figure out how we can get along together. And I think, I think if you take a look at legislation that I've done across the across the spectrum, I would guess, and you can check me on this, but probably 75% of the bills I introduce have a Republican lawmaker on the bill. Why do I do this? One of the first bills I did last session went to Representative Igo. I got him as number two on an on ATV bill because I wanted to show you that unity across the district. That's how we get things done, by working together and figuring out how we can get past our differences and and get something accomplished and until un, thank you until we get until we get to that point i see a long struggle ahead for us and, and uh but i'm committed i'm committed to working with my allies across the aisle where it makes sense and where it's necessary
Roger. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, Non-ferrous mining, how do we get it across the, the goal line? Uh, in 1902, we had a Model A car, and in 2022, we have Teslas, Model Ys. Um, do we compare the two when we talk about vehicles? We don't. In 1902, copper nickel mining existed. In 2022, we have copper nickel mining. Why are they still being compared? They shouldn't even be compared. They're two different processes. And in, in 2022, uh, the regulatory agencies, whether they're staffed or not, need to be held to a timeline. Um, that's where our in regulatory, our shortcoming is. Uh, I'm chairman of St. Louis County Planning Commission, and when you bring in a, a variance or a conditional use permit, we have 90 days to act on it. If we do not act on it in 90 days, it automatically becomes what you want it. So, I would propose the same for a mining permit to agree, not, I'm not going to pick a time, but I would agree with the members across the aisle and say, what is a good time? Is two years, is three years, and then we sit down and say, in three years, uh, all the regulatory agencies are going to have their stuff together. If there's not, and there can be many reasons, we will work together to, to find a date, but to, to have a corporation or a company or anybody come and say, I want to start a business in your community. And 20 years later, like, we're still here. We still want to start the business. It, it's, it, it's not fair and it's just not right as who we are as people. Um, and just as a side note, uh, I just don't understand the, the DFL leadership when it comes to copper nickel mining. I just don't understand it. It's like it doesn't it doesn't come up in meetings and hearings, um, and and maybe it's, I'm not following it close enough. But I, I truly believe that the DFL right now does not want to support it, and and I'm hoping that in the future we can get those feet. I'm from Ely. I'm at Ground Zero. The mining is you know 15 miles from my house is where they want to do it. I support it. I, I know who they are. I know what they are. I would love to take legislators up to Ely. I would love to take them on a canoe trip to Curtin Falls on Crooked Lake on the Canadian border and show them if anything is polluted, it's going to come right through here. Do you want to be part of the pollution? I don't want to be. Nobody wants to be. So if they see the value of what we have and not to change it, I think we can have uh, copper nickel mining done safely like they're doing in Canada right now. Thank you. Dave, let's look at Thank you. Follow the process, meet or exceed both state and federal standards and allow uh, these businesses to move forward. It's not that complicated. We live in a global economy, we all can agree with that, but we also live in a global environment. And we have no business exporting our jobs and this country's conscience overseas to third world countries that don't have the same labor or environmental standards. That is a problem that we need to address. We need to streamline. We need to streamline the permitting. Keep in mind the opposition's goal is to delay, delay, delay to kill the project. And they do that because capital will leave where it's not welcome. And that's extremely important to understand. I have to address um, Representative Igo. I, did, I never once, ever, voted against mining. What he is referring to, and I'm sure Julie's going to want to talk about it, he's referring to an amendment that he offered. He offered this amendment on the Climate Energy Bill, where it was not ruled germane. In politics, there is a pol there, there's, there, there's procedures. And if you're going to offer an amendment, it has to be germane to the bill. What he didn't do, and it bothers me that he's trying to bring this up, because I take it real personal. He didn't offer it on the environment bill, where it was germane. Rob, Julie, or I, we voted to uphold the ruling of the speaker that it was not germane. Never once did we vote against his bill. That is the facts and that is the truth. 
My grandfather helped build Erie Mining Company that became LTV, where, where I all work. I was the former mayor and city council of Aurora. You know, remember the polymet and the 13 buses? That was me. Steve Georgie with Rams, every stage, every rally that Nancy McCready went to, I helped set the stage. I was there every step of the way. I went from local to state to Washington, D.C. to advocate for mining. We have a wonderful opportunity. It is the next generation. This world is transitioning, and that transition needs these minerals. And we have the opportunity to do it here. We have to stop using mining as a political football to win elections. That does need to stop. Because at the end of the day, we all do better when we work together. Thank you. Well, I am a very big proponent of the copper nickel mining. Uh, just a fun story, I was in the ninth grade uh, in 2001 when uh, PolyMet came in and they said, you will be the first graduating class to have jobs at our mine. And that excited me because all my friends were gonna stay around the area and obviously that has been about well, what, 20, 22 years since. Uh, I think our, our permitting process is, is very flawed. Uh, we need to, uh, if, if Canada with you know, in the same watershed can permit a, a gold mine in five years, I don't know why we can't, we can't do the same thing. Um, this, this is uh, hundreds of jobs, and uh, I've, I've once been told that this is a uh, Super Bowl every year for Northeastern Minnesota, about $500 million economic impact to have just one of these operations opened. Uh, there's, there's no reason why these are not up and running right now. Uh, we, we have been mining in this region for over 130 years. We do it better than anybody. Uh, we have been credited with winning two world wars because of what we've done. We've built every city in the nation. And uh, with the future, uh, precious metals are, are the future, and, and the Iron Range needs to be the leader and build the future. So uh, I don't know how else to say better than that, but uh, Iron Range first, and, and let's, uh, let's make the next century ours. We have about 15 minutes left, uh, so I want to keep going, get through at least two more questions. Uh, Spencer, I'm going to start this one with you. Uh, Small towns are relying on local government aid. Uh, groups have been working on a formula to increase local government aid. How do you see LGA impacting the towns that you represent or want to represent, and how would you change it in the future? So that's a really good question, right? LGA is very critical, right, for a lot of our, our, our range communities. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those ways, again, we can give a hand up to local communities to make sure they stay strong and vibrant. I mean, it's not it's no surprise one of the biggest things we saw this year that I've been hearing at the doors and we've gotten a lot of personal phone calls about uh, has been people's rising uh, valuations on their homes, right? I believe Itasca County was number two in the state, and I think St. Louis County was in the top ten. Um, LGA is one of those things that helps off, off, uh, off put that if, if they can, if, if cities and small towns and communities can keep their levies lower uh, with those funds. So when it comes down to that formula, um, it's incredibly complex. Uh, right, and it, it, it's worth time for us to sit down as bipartisan legislators to work, actually work through the process and make sure that it's a fair system uh, that works for everyone, whether it be on the Iron Range, whether it be in southern Minnesota, uh, whether it be in western Minnesota. We need to be making sure to do things that lift up all communities and all Minnesotans uh, so we can all prosper uh, together. I'll try to keep it quick so we can get through those questions. No, I'm going to go to Julie, just okay. uh, keeping the races okay. together. And, no, that's yeah. great. That's great. So. LGA, critically important. Hibbing has one of the largest uh, square mileage footprints for communities up here. The LGA that they currently get is not enough for the roads they have to plow, etc. We need to have those fixes. Those fixes were in the tax bill. Those fixes were in the tax bill, along with county program aid, which is similar. Um, it, it, it helps with the county programs that we have. Again, all in the tax bill. In the tax bill this time, social security taxes eliminated for our seniors. In the tax bill, which sat dead, which sat going nowhere. And unfortunately, we can say we, we support these things, but Republicans walked away on a tax bill. They walked away from the LGA they say they support. They walked away from eliminating taxes on social security. 
They walked away from county program aid. They walked away from lowering your property taxes. We had the surplus, we had the ability to do that, and it didn't happen. So LGA is critically important, but putting a, a representative, a senator, in the legislature that's actually going to support those initiatives when it comes time to vote is equally important. Matt Dorn. Well, I know it's a little out of my district, but I had a, uh, a friend up in the uh, Ori area reach out to me about, about this issue, and I know that it's uh, critically important for, for small communities, and they're I think it needs to be addressed on all levels. It needs to be, I, I think it needs to be fixed more than anything. For some reason, it sounds like there's a lot of hiccups going on with it in general. So uh, I, I just believe that uh, we need to get some people that um, that are w with the most experience in this in this region and, uh, and come to a common solution so that uh, this the smaller communities aren't as, aren't hit as hard and, and can get what they, what they need to run, run their communities. Dave? Well, thank you. Um, I agree with Matt, experience matters. And uh, as a city councilor and, in a mayor, and as a mayor of Aurora, I know the importance. Um, local government aid is uh, based on uh, wealth. And uh, so I'll use Virginia as an example, the city that Matt lives in. Um, it's my largest district that I currently represent and their budget is a little over $12 million annually. Every year they receive $6,049,547 every single year. Half their budget comes from local government aid, and that is across the iron range. Um, it's between 40 and 50 percent because we don't have the wealth. We don't have that. And what people don't understand is, is where the money comes from. 68% of all money generated in the state of Minnesota comes from the seven county metro. And you may say, why is that? Well, there's three ways that money is generated. Sales tax, property tax, and income tax. Where does everyone live? Seven county metro. They have the wealth. And the Democrats up here, we have fought to bring that money here for our region across Evelyn, Gilbert, Virginia, Aurora, Biwabic, Chisholm, all of them. Can you imagine what Virginia's taxes would be if they lost $6 million of their annual budget? That's how important. LGA pays for police, fire, infrastructure for the communities. That is something that cannot go away. I'm proud to say that the three of us up here, we support it to restore the LGA that was taken away during the Plenty administration to balance the budget. They also wanted to go after the IRRB. Those are our production tax in lieu of property taxes. So I'm committed to bringing as much money from Minneapolis-St. Paul back to Northeast Minnesota and the people that I represent because it is essential and critical for the healthy uh, viability of our communities. Roger. Thank you. Um, Dave, uh, I, I echo exactly what you just, you just said. Uh, uh, I'm a mayor of a small town. We get <clears throat> two-thirds of our uh, money from LGA. We get a lot. Uh, anything that increases helps us a lot. I would not, this is where I keep campaigning, say, you know, I'm not going to vote 100% with the Republican Party. Um, if there's anything that I can do to get more Republicans to support the LGA so it's not an issue, I will do it because I'm a user of it. I understand it. I completely, um, we do not waste it. It's used. It's, it is the essential what keeps us up here. Um, <clears throat> uh, the, biggest, the biggest issue about local government aid is that I've seen in the legislature is when they try to compare the Iron Range dollars to Minneapolis dollars, you know, because Minneapolis shouldn't get that much, they're big, and, and again, fight a different fight to get at Minneapolis. Don't use the LGA. <clears throat> the LGA is important to Northern Minnesota. Without it, 
um, I really don't know what communities would do. It is that important. And I will stand up for it. I have absolutely no problem standing up for it. Um, and as far as the tax bill or any, any of the bills, you know, like the legislature sitting on right now, I mean, it's been said before, and I'll say it again, the governor can call a special session whenever he wants, and it's up to him. No one else can do it. How we got where we are, we can point fingers at each other all day long, um, but the governor can call a special session. And as a mayor, as a member of RAMS, I've signed letters and sent out saying, call a special session, call a special session, because everyone's going to benefit from northern Minnesota from the tax bill and from the uh, uh, bonding bill. So it's important that it does, but the governor's the only one that can call it. Thank you. Rob. So we had a terrific tax bill. We had an agreement between the three leadership groups. Um, and I'm gonna circle back here a little bit. How many people here know realtors? Okay, the pandemic showed us something. The pandemic showed us that, that Northern Minnesota is a terrific place to live. And our realtors have been banner years. That's why your property valuations are up. That's why people are so worried about their property tax increases. But I've been kind of watching how the operating levies are going, and we're seeing 5.6s, 5.7s, 5.2s. Not too bad. Uh, Mayor, what's Ely's? Did you set yours? We, we're at 7, but we're not going okay. anything below 4. So, it's going to be 4 below. So a lot of people don't realize is the local government's, local units government have to set their operating levy early, and then they have a chance to work on their budget and adjust it. And I've seen these 5.6s, 5.7s, 7s, but most of them are, gonna, are, are going to set their levies lower. So that's going to be helpful for the property tax payers, except for the valuations went up. And we had a fix for that. We had a local government aid formula change. We had county program formula change, county program aid. And maybe the biggest one that I was the chief author of was the payment in lieu of taxes uh, change that the counties get from in northern, mostly northern Minnesota, that the counties get to manage tax forfeited properties. All these things would have been fixed in the tax bill as long as well as the Social Security relief if the agreement had been followed. We had agreement in good faith. The Senate GOP walked away from that amongst many other things. And the mayor, Mr. Mayor, you are right. The governor can call a special session, but to call a special session <clears throat> when there isn't another agreement, when, you're, when you've been burned once, burned twice, um, I, can, I can understand why you didn't. And I've urged the governor to call a special session for, uh, on another topic for the, the um, North Shore miners. Their unemployment, un unemployment insurance is going to run out in November. We need a special session just for that, if nothing else. And talking to leadership last week, they tried to broker a deal call a special session just for a bonding bill that would put our construction trades to work and they couldn't even come to an agreement on that. So that's where we're at. Washington politics has come to Minnesota, but I'm committed to try to fix that. Thank you. All right, it's 7.54. There's six minutes and six candidates. You guys can decide the math. <laughs> what time we want to adjourn. But no, we're going to start with uh, Representative Liz Lagarde. We'll come down this way. Um, in your closing remarks, how can the legislature and the governor of any party, no matter what happens in November, get their work done without special sessions and without delays? Well, <clears throat> one of the things about um, politics in the legislature, it's not hitting a red button or a green button. It's much more complicated than that. And uh, you have to have the ability to be pragmatic and the ability to compromise. And I gotta be honest with you, we keep hearing about the tax bill. Well, that tax bill went to conference Democrats and Republicans work together to get that done. I'm proud to say that as Vice Chair of Taxes, I was on that committee. It was my bill in the House and Senator Bach's bill in the Senate to eliminate the tax on Social Security. The ability to come together and be pragmatic is the only way in a divided government. A cookie cutter politician would be one that is only effective when their party's in charge. The ability to be effective and navigate through a very complex system 
You have to work across the aisle. You have to listen. And you have to be open. Rob is right. It is becoming more toxic on both sides, the far right and the far left. Extremism is what's bad in politics. Extremism is what's bad in politics. Be kind, listen, and work together is the only way we're going to get it done. And, 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 and I'm going to tell you, this last, I blame a little bit of both on that last, uh, on that last, um, that last whatever session that we had. Because I think that there could have been a deal, but there wasn't. There wasn't a deal. And guess who suffered? The state of Minnesota. I blame the Republicans, but I also, we have to take responsibility because if something doesn't get over the finish line, there's two people. And that's important to understand. That's important to understand as, as, as legislators, to be accountable for the actions and the decisions that we make. So, I will tell you that I think that the governor in a three-way, where you have a legislator, you have a, you have a house, you have a senate, and you have a governor. If you can't work together, and you can't listen, we're not going to get anywhere. And that's what's sad in politics. And for D.C. to come here, and, the, and all the bickering, is exactly what's wrong in politics. And I'm committed to being that pragmatic, that independent and trusted voice to work across the aisle for the people that I represent. That's who I am, that's what I've been, and I've never wavered, and that's what I'm going to continue to do. I appreciate every single one of you guys for being here and listening and the people that are streaming. Because politics is, it touches our lives. Every single one of us, every day, it touches our lives. And to be engaged is extremely important. Matt is a wonderful, wonderful man. And I'm glad that you, he's running because he cares. But I believe in my heart that where we're at with losing Senator Bach and Senator Tomasoni, that experience and the ability to navigate through that complex system is exactly what this range needs. And that's why I'm committed to running and that's what I'm committing to doing. So thank you so much. Matt Nari. Well, thank you, Dave. I uh, couldn't agree with you more. Uh, the divided house is, is uh, nothing can happen with that. And uh, I, w I would like to thank you for, uh, you know, being my, uh, my opponent because uh, actually it's been kind of nice. You don't have to <laughs> sling against each other. But um, the one thing that I uh, bring to the table is that I was uh, in, in the beverage industry my entire life and we fought many battles uh, with different brands. And when it came to uh, floor space or it came to tap lines, there, there was that ultimate compromise. Um, we, didn't, we didn't drag it out in the street, but we, uh, we came to the table and uh, we came and brought what was best for our customer and what would, uh, would benefit that, that account the most. Uh, obviously, everybody's side, you, know, you want to win. Uh, I, I don't think anybody goes on anything to lose. Uh, but when you take the ultimate victory for yourself, uh, everybody loses. And the Iron Range is a very special place to me. I, I want to see the Iron Range win. Um, that, is, that is what's most important. And how I look at this is this is the biggest job interview uh, I, anybody could ever go through. And um, no matter, you know, like me, love me, hate me, whatever, um, <laughs> every, everybody uh, has to have a representative. And, and, that's, and that is the most important thing. And I think if everybody just took their area for, for what it is and for, for their love of their area and went down to St. Paul and just did the best for everybody, uh, I think that that could um, to make, make a change uh, just in our inner state and, and maybe that could go nationally. So um, if if I'm if I'm elected, I would uh, I would definitely work with everybody because uh, my motto is I can never have enough friends. So uh, thank you everybody for being here, and I really appreciate you taking uh, a night out of your week. Thank you so much. I actually think that um, the question before us is something we haven't talked about or haven't talked about much, but. Can the state of Minnesota really expect to get things done when you have a $46 billion budget, B, billion, and you have 180 days over the course of two years to get this done? I think, and I'm not 
I'm not advocating one way or the other. I think we're at a crossroads as to whether we need a part-time legislature or a full-time legislature with the size of our budget and the amount of work that we need to get done. I think that question needs to be answered at some point, probably sooner than later. The other way I think we need to get things done and can get things done is by vetting the bills that are dropped in the hopper. We had over 5,000 bills introduced, or approximately, I think it was right around 5,000 bills introduced this legislative session. You can't do that. You can't have that many bills actually looked at, evaluated, put through a committee process, debated, brought up on a floor. It's impossible. So we need to limit the number of bills and really hone in on um, maybe focal areas. We need to recognize we're not all going to get it done in one session. But we need to be willing to make progress towards that which we are hopeful for. One of the bills that we had had money in it for the Cross Range Expressway. And this is, this is something that is going to be used to drive the economy up here. But I had members vote against it because it was too much or it was too little or it wasn't perfect. It isn't about perfection in government. It's rarely about perfection in government. It's about progress. So we need to be willing to make progress. 5,000 bills is too many. And then I think we need standalone bills. We need to be doing more work where we have individual standalone bills and not waiting to the end and everything tries to get crammed into an omnibus bill where it's impossible truly, even as an educator, to read over a thousand dollar or a thousand page bill and fully understand the content of what you're voting on. So we need to do less well, if I had to summarize. Thank you so much for coming out tonight and hearing us, and uh, I really appreciate you being here. Spencer, I So I'll just kind of take off where uh, Julie kind of left off there with the omnibus bills. You know, that is a huge reason to why we're seeing so much good luck. You know, for example, some of the ways these omnibus bills work out, um, we'll get an email that the bill has been released at 10.30 at night and it's 634 pages long, and the session is convening at noon the next day. Get ready to vote on it. Holy smokes, like that, that doesn't work for people. And then when you look into that bill, 70% of it might be the best thing that ever happened for the range. But the other 30% of the bill could mean horrors for the range. We can't be held at gunpoint like that. And that's why we need to return to, uh, to passing individual bills on their own. In fact, this legislative session, we passed the least amount of bills in Minnesota state history. Uh, that's a colossal disappointment by all of us, Republicans and Democrats. I think when it comes to working together, I try to keep something in my mind. I look at the state as 30% Republican, 30% Democrat, and 40% vote for Jesse Ventura to be governor. And if we all remember that a little bit more, I think we'd get a lot more done. And I'll use an example of, you know, we're on the House floor late at night sometimes. And it was probably, I think it was one in the morning. And you know, everyone's just kind of dragging on, we're drinking coffee, and um, a member from the Metro DFL came and sat down next to me. Uh, her and I actually uh, went to college for the same thing, so we were talking and getting to know each other. Um, I ended up having a conversation with her about why I was sponsoring a bill to have a wolf hunt. And we had an honest to goodness personal conversation for 20 minutes. And when we left that conversation, she understood why I was doing it. And was going to start talking to her constituents about why she would need to support something like this. Those are the things we can do when we set aside our differences. Um, and, and, and like Rob over here, I mean, you look at my bills, they're the same way. I, try, I, I, I honestly put my bills to a test. There should be no such thing as a far right or a far left bill. There's too much that needs to happen. And the final thing that we need to do to stop this gridlock so we get a complete session on time is get rid of what I call the triumvirate. So what that is is when the governor and the majority leader and the speaker of the house sign a deal, that doesn't mean that you sign the deal for me and my 45,000 constituents or any of ours at this table. We need to get back to legislators being a part of the circle altogether. Because just because we vote for our elected leaders in our own caucuses doesn't mean they all of a sudden represent our constituents. Everyone at this table represents their constituents. And I have done that with my constituents up to this point. So I want to thank everyone for being here today, those of you watching at home. Um, this is really a critical election, and thank you for getting involved. I think after COVID, everyone, regardless of your party, realize how important it is for us to be involved as a community, to stand together and work together, and we will bring our best days to reality. Thank you.
Come back then. Well, thanks. So uh, I remember uh, seven years ago when I was in the minority, my first day of session, Mary Murphy came up to me and she said, Rob Eklund, remember, you begged for this job. So, <laughs> and you know what I still love doing this job? I tell people when I'm on the doors that I'm one of the moderates that's left. And I, and, I, and I think what's happened to our political system now is we've got the nuts on the right and the nuts on the left. I didn't mean to look at just that anyway, so, uh, but we have the, here on my left anyway, but uh, we have the nuts on the right, nuts on the left that are working overtime to have control of our political process. And I think it's up to us that are moderates to make sure that doesn't happen. Now we talk about omnibus bills. There's been om omnibus bills in my seven years that I've been there, so that's nothing new. And prior to my legislative career, I spent a lot of time working for the Union Dons Legislature, and the 10 years at least prior to that, there were omnibus bills, so this is nothing new. So we can all, all complain about it and talk about what the bad and evil things with omnibus bills, but I really think what we need to do is, is uh, Representative Sensted maybe hit the nail on the head, we need to look and see if we are allowing us ourselves enough time to actually process a $47 billion state budget in the allotted time that we have by the Constitution, and if there should be changes. Heaven forbid, I am not an advocate for a full-time legislature. I'm too old for that. However, at some point in time, for the goodness of the state of Minnesota, we may need to have that conversation because we are not getting our work done in the time allotted, and you as the voters should be disappointed with that. I am committed to trying to fix that. I am committed to try to streamline the process if we can, but we have to figure out a way forward where we can actually get our work done. Thank you for everybody for coming out tonight. I really appreciate the audience. I appreciate the time that you've given us. And Roger, we'll wrap with you. I thought you were going to say last but not least. Okay, thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> So, you know, uh, the, the no omnibus bills, uh, I, I got to tell you, uh, we have Iron Range delegation not at the table here that, you know, they got a lot of stuff for the Iron Range in those omnibus bills. That's how we got a lot of uh, stuff passed. Um, <clears throat> I personally, when elected, I will not support them. I will vote, like Julie said, they should be standalone. Everything should stand alone. Um, and it is time, I, I personally don't want to go to a full-time uh, legislature, but if that's what it's going to have to take so that we don't get this uh, last minute, you got to get this, you got to do it. We have to work, we have to dis discipline ourselves down there and make sure that when we uh, start this process, we know that the timeline is, where it is and how it works. And, and if your bill didn't get in, your bill didn't get in. You know, it's just how it works, like Julie said. It's another time, another day, another year. Um, and, and as mayor, uh, I, I was elected by Democrats and Republicans. So I do represent both sides. And I know how to represent both sides. I've been doing it for eight years. Um, I, I look forward to going to the Capitol and representing both sides again. Um, I have to pick a party to run on, and the Republican Party aligned with who I am and what I am. Um, and, and the mining issue was one of the biggest ones. Um, I see Northern Minnesota uh, benefiting from a, um, a, a special session, just if we can get one. Um, but I don't know that we're going to. But uh, without, without a special session, how am I going to make it happen next year? Again, uh, it's what I do. I, I work together with both sides. I'm not afraid to bring people up to our community and show them. Uh, bring them to I Falls, I'll bring them to Silver Bay, I'll bring them to Beaver Bay, Grand Marais, wherever they want to go to in our district, that I'll bring them to North Home if they really want to see some cool stuff. You know, it's like, we have a big district. But, and then they can see how we live and what we live, and then they might be able to start supporting what we want, because we are different. We, we don't have, uh, it takes seven hours to drive across our district. There are people in the metro area, they can walk across their district. We can't. So uh, how am I going to do it? I'm going to work hard. I'm going to work together. I, I'm not uh, as partisan. I'm a moderate like Rob. I've always claimed to be that. 
Uh, but one of, the, one of the last things I want to leave everyone with, I want to thank you all. I think it's important that the democracy gets aired out like it is. And I really would appreciate your vote on November 8th. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for uh, bearing with us. Uh, thanks to Rams. Thanks to the Saudi Tribune. Thanks to Hibbing Public Access. I'll say this. I will do 27 forums, debates, or roundtables this year. Uh, this panel of six is probably the most civil uh, that I've had, or uh, will probably have in the next six weeks. So, you, uh, the range is special. Thanks for having me. Good night. <laughs>